tactics are different than ideas. As long as you do not grift on your principles, that's what really matters at the end of the day. Because tactics will always change. Battle lines will always be different. Who you align with, like I've said five other times now, will always be different. And sometimes, sometimes being passionate and being radical and fighting to win, that's not always bad. Uh, but some people, they confuse that for being then too hyper-partisan or too bad or, or negative or whatever. And sometimes it's actually a good thing. All right, Thomas, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me on, Artie. Uh, you are the founder and president of Atheist for, Liber Atheist for Liberty, and you're a founding member and co-chair of the Clarity Coalition. Yeah. Uh, for listeners that might not be familiar with you, anything else that you'd want them to know about you? Gen Z or political junkie, uh, likes to talk about various controversial culture war type stuff. Um, got involved in, in atheist work over a decade ago, and then that proceeded as well with an in interest in politics and, and quite a variety of other issues. What did your uh, interest in politics start after being an atheist or uh, was that before? It started around the same time, mainly focusing on secularism, um, stuff pertaining to prayer in schools, creationism in schools, um, the issues of Islam and defending the West, uh, political correctness pertaining to the topics of religion. Um, all this stuff, uh, especially topics around free speech on the internet, they were all starting to brew up around a decade ago, 2013, 14, relating to what can you discuss, what can you debate, what can you criticize, especially when it comes to people's deeply held beliefs. And I joined right on the apex of um, a very powerful American atheist movement. Mm. Um, things varied and waved over the years due to different cultural changes, issues, things like that, which caused myself and others to form Atheists for Liberty a few years ago. Um, but uh, no, that interest has has stayed solidly the, around the same time, politics and and the whole atheist stuff um, for, for going on over a decade strong now. Awesome. Uh, as Gen Z, what what drives you to talk about contentious topics? Because we're, it seems like we've gotten in, the world has changed over the years so that people are talking less and less about controversial topics. So what, what compels you to go against the grain there? I think it's just this liking of dopamine, liking of controversy, wanting fast results, not being part of older generations that want to wait longer to get answers. Um, so it, it's kind of that mix of mix of stuff growing up in the age of the internet. Um, I like to see a problem that has a white space where I can carve in there and, and, and put myself to work and, and create a solution. And so at least when it comes to religion, when it comes to these kind of topics that are going to sway our civilization in debate for the next century, at least for the next several decades, uh, I think I position myself fairly well there. And it all relates to controversy, all relates to um, um, a lot of things that people find contentious. But I think that's where I operate best. And, and definitely I can speak on behalf of my team at Atheists for Liberty too. What would you say the overarching goals of Atheists for Liberty is? So we have four pillars. We want to normalize atheism, preserve free thinking, safeguard secularism, and advance individual liberty. We want to protect freedom of and from religion. We want to make sure that people can criticize any and all ideas um, without being persecuted in your society. Um, we want our separation of church and state to be protected and not be seen as partisan. It shouldn't be seen as left wing nor right wing. Um, and we want to revive an atheist counterculture that is transcendent and, 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 and or, or rather transparent and not tied to a particular political ideology and fighting mm. for liberty in the context that it matters for the best secular country in the world to thrive. Uh, hence why we came up with the title. Hence why we got involved when we did in the culture wars a few years ago. Um, and it's why we also have a very, very uh intellectually and politically diverse uh, range of members because of those pillars. Yeah. I like uh, that you're focused on preserving freedom of and for religion. Cause I think that it, it ties in together and a lot of people miss that when they get mm -hmm. into the religious conversation, you get religious people thinking that it should be more ingrained. And then you have many people who are atheists think, you know, you just want to be free from religion, but they, there's no this or that, like they tie mm -hmm. in together, right? Like there's a big, if you having freedom of religion is having freedom from religion and, and yeah. having, yeah, like it just goes. It, it all has to do with free speech, yeah. right? So I, it's why I laugh at the face of 
you know, woke amoebic type people and, and Islamic apologists and all these people when they say their feelings are hurt when, when free speech is allowed in a free society. Um, there's no such thing as love speech. We have, we call things we disagree with free speech for a reason. I think that religion is full of superstition. I think that we should outgrow it in the 21st century. I think that we are becoming a more secular country in a more secular world. And despite all the cultural problems, the political issues that we might be facing right now, we've overall been growing in a much and much better world. But we always like to talk about the negative more than the positive in politics. Um, and it's because I think we have been using reason more than religion in many ways. Uh, but simultaneously, the reason why we secularism has thrived, the reason why reason has thrived so much is because of those freedoms that existed in the first place. And it's to also allow bad ideas to be in the marketplace of everything um, so they can be criticized. Um, and, and that includes religion, that includes religious beliefs. Um, uh, it's why that when during the COVID pandemic and definitely you and I met a freedom fest. So very, for all the, I guess, libertarians that are watching the Liberty lovers that are watching, um, I was in favor of churches, uh, being able to remain open during the lockdowns mm -hmm. and shutdowns during the pandemic, even though I think churches are a waste of time, even though I think religious institutions are outdated. Uh, and in the past, when we did not know where the sun went when we went to sleep at night and, you know, uh, couldn't figure out questions, what happens when we died? Freedom of speech and your freedom to believe in whatever you want to believe is part of being a great American. And I will defend anybody religious person, anybody who's a theist, anybody who's an atheist, anybody who's on the left, anybody who's on the right, who wants that freedom to be able to speak, at least in a broad context, uh, you know, with, with certain limited exceptions. Um to the best of my ability. Um, and that includes allowing, uh, you know, every part, every tenet of the First Amendment to be protected. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. We, you know, we as atheists need to understand there's not only an establishment clause, and we shouldn't get too soft on the establishment clause just to appease religious people, but we also have that free exercise clause too. And also, if we protect that free exercise clause, it makes us, the atheists, look good too at the end of the day. It's a win-win scenario. Um, if we have freedom of speech, we have to be consistent in protecting that freedom for everybody. Yeah, and, and the freedom to choose what you believe is basically the, it's a fundamental aspect of freedom of expression. If you can't, ex if you can't choose whether you do or don't worship a, a, a god or religion, or if, if, you, if you're not free to practice what you want, then you really don't have any freedom. Yep, exactly. It seems like, uh, I guess you're more aligned with libertarian values in general. Would that be accurate? I'm a weird hybrid. <laughs> uh, my political identity and where I belong has changed so much throughout the years, but I would say so. I am consistent in promoting liberty. I'm consistent in promoting the First Amendment. I'm a big culture war type person. And uh, for the last several years, my allies have been mainly, uh, at least on those topics, uh, primarily on the right, from, from the center left all the way to the right. Um, uh, so, so I, so, so in order to uh, answer that in a short way, yes, <laughs> yes, but with some explanation. Yeah. Uh, I guess I should point out real quick. So we're recording this on November 6th and it'll be released next week. So to, like eight days. So on what's that? The 14th. So we're a little bit delayed. We just had an election last night in the U S and yeah. For anyone listening, if we're if we say anything outdated as it becomes topical, I just want to <laughs> be warning right there with uh, the time difference of when we're recording and when it'll release. But I think there's a it's interesting because the threats with religion are different on both sides as you go left and right, right? Like with the right, you're you're worried about religion becoming too much uh a part of like what you're expected to do it with your individual self, um, the religion becoming overbearing and too much of a part of our politics. And then with the left, you kind of have the opposite where, you know, it, if you go toward communism and things like that, they have a history of trying to get rid of religion because it's a threat to the state. So how mm -hmm. do you, how do you balance that, um, I guess you're just the more reasonable atheist, right? Yeah, and it, it involves us pissing off quite 
quite a lot of people because we we have to fight a two front war then. So um, we are uh, we are no strangers to combating this this new religion, this dogmatic religion that's propped up over the last you could say six, seven, eight years, what we call social justice, critical social justice, wokeness, whatever you want to name it, whatever it's going to be known as in a year or two. Um, because in many ways, those forces have actually defended theocra uh, theocracy, just their own more progressive brands of theocracy. So yeah. we, we've gone after the religion of Islam in many cases, which have been defended by these, you could say, communist type agitators um, because of this intersectional hierarchy that they have. So that actually is a problem for atheists. It is an issue for our secular republic, if you actually think about it, when you have a political force like that using this politically correct leftist hierarchy in order to keep that uh, certain certain more traditional religious structures alive just to not look like they're bigots. Um, so we, we sprouted out uh, in 2020, we started planning this, uh, the existence of this organization in 2019 when the culture wars were a little bit different than they are now, like combating wokeism and social justice was still very fresh, very new. Um, political alignments were a little bit different than they are now today. Um, so we focused heavily on that because a lot of other atheist organizations, think tanks that existed at that time, they caved to this social justice religion where they'll talk all the time about Christianity or uh, Judaism, but they won't go after Islam in a, mm -hmm. in a criticism of monotheism type context. Um, on the other hand, too, we're, we simultaneously, um, while we want to align with even theists that protect freedom of speech and freedom from and from religion, that's also not going to make us hide from being the passionate, free thinking atheists that we are. And it means combating all forms of theocracy, no matter who our so-called friends or enemies could be, you know, on one day or another. So we are still very much in favor of the separation between church and state. We still very much criticize Christian theocracy. We still very much see that as a threat to our republic. Um, Christian nationalism is actually quite real, not in the way that maybe CNN would say it all the time, um, but definitely as something that is very much a, a problem, very much a threat. Um, in this country. And definitely, you know, we had an election that happened yesterday on November 5th. We're recording this, like you said, on November 6th. Political alignments and shifting is going to happen again. Now that um, Donald Trump has been reelected as president, um, because he's not going to be running for office again, you are going to see certain factions on the right split off and align with other sectors of things. You're going to be seeing the political left and it's extreme elements and moderate elements reorganize as well. And when it comes to secular orga organizing within this country, you're going to see uh, alliances change and different, different methods of communication uh, pop up with certain groups. Um, and so I'm awaiting that. I'm awaiting that with popcorn in hand. Uh, but the one thing that is consistent is our consistency in fighting for liberty, in fighting for religious freedom, in fighting for secular government, and criticizing bad ideas no matter who we piss off. Um, and that's the one thing that's going to make our institution thrive no matter what culture war we're in, no matter what year we're in, no matter what election we're in, too. Um, as you can see, I'm kind of worn out a little bit because, uh, yeah. because of the, the whole election and everything, but um, the principles remain. The mission remains, um, and it's why I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to wake up every day and to still run this great organization uh, because of, of the principles that we have and uh, the grifting that we don't engage in. We don't grift. We're not, we're not people that, that, um, that change our views depending on you know who's our friend and who's our enemy one year after another. It gets to be a pretty hard position to be in when you have some nuance to your uh, when when you have nuance to your views because we're in this black and white dichotomy of of how we're supposed to look at politics or how we're pushed to looking into politics. It could be very hard because you're you might be aligned with a Trump supporter on on so many things, but then you start to push back on other things, and then same with the left. Maybe you have a little bit less in common with some of the things pushed on the left, but you have some things that resonate and you're like, Oh, I do agree with that. Yep. And, uh, you get kind of, I mean, you've created a home in atheist for Liberty, but you've as where you belong in the political spectrum, you're homeless in a certain sense, it seems. Right. And I like it. 
I like that almost. I running a 501c3 organization, obviously you cannot legally endorse candidates or political parties, even though I have my own political preferences. And I've been in different areas of politics throughout my my young adult life. I started out on the left, then for a while I, I went to the right. And I have my views still, but now I am when being president of Atheists for Liberty and having such a diverse array of members from Democrats to Libertarians to Republicans to independents and centrists, um, it's forced me to be in many ways kind of apolitical and to realize, that, okay, there are going to be some ways that the left will benefit us and there are going to be some ways that the right will benefit us. And we're going to have people from the RNC in our organization. We're going to have people from the DNC in our organization, the LNC in our organization. And how can we still benefit the country as a whole and the American population as a whole without letting the 2024 internet political gridlock of things kind of get in the way of it. So it's kind of nice actually being kind of homeless in that regard. It's kind of a, you could say a blessing in disguise. It's, it's, it forces me to, to, to think beyond the typical overflowing debate of good guy, bad guy, team red, team blue nonsense that quite frankly, after being in these, these culture wars ever since 2013, um, I'm quite tired of it. Hmm. Yeah, I, I resonate with a lot of what you're saying. I, I feel like it, as much as you might feel, I think it's a good thing for people to feel politically homeless, actually. Like when I, I had somebody tell me they felt disenfranchised with the Democratic Party at one point, and I said, I think it's good to not identify too closely with any of the parties or any ideology or anything, uh, just because you start having all these blind spots like you you just stop seeing what's really going on you start to i see people embrace kind of bigotry more often when they when they just adopt a party view because it's like yeah. well now you're just intolerant of whoever disagrees with you i've so seen both see the, i've seen both sides do it i've seen yeah. a lot of part on my facebook feed for instance i'm friends with a lot of political junkies i've seen the super woke hyper partisanship of of some certain Democrat political junkies, for instance, unfriend certain fellow liberals for simply, and of course, this is a this is a podcast culture we're talking point that's like 10 years old at this point, I know, guys, but yeah. like for having politically incorrect views or, or liberal views that were acceptable five years ago, but are not acceptable now. So I, I've kind of seen that and this kind of uh, this happened in the atheist movement, this mass unfriending, this mass blocking, this mass blacklisting that kind of happened there. And I started to see elements of that as well during my years more on the right as well um, in certain areas of local politics in certain areas of state level politics uh, when it comes to certain natural culture war stuff this there's there, a political correctness when it comes to maybe criticizing Christianity because oh we want to be super nice to the Christians because woke is bad but we've been fighting wokeness for what six seven eight years as a movement now um, you know when are we going to get back to fighting based upon the atheistic, you know, secular principles of what you were founded on as well. And so I saw kind of a grifting on that. And then, you know, I, I, I've, I've seen in both the my time in the Democrat and Republican parties, you know, depending on where, depending on which sector, what locality, don't want to get into too many specifics, forms of corruption, sleaziness, um, uh, some, some really nasty things that can really negatively warp your mind as a young person if you don't kind of step back and try to critically think of what's in front of you. Um, and so, yeah, running Atheists for Liberty, having that IRS kind of restriction actually has uh, saved me in a way. Hmm. It's allowed me to kind of operate beyond the simplicity and stupidity of bad, good guy, bad guy, team red, team blue crap. I, when okay. I, I had an election victory. I hosted an election um election night victory party last night. And I had a bunch of my friends who were Republicans and my friends who were Democrats that were both there. And we... Uh, while we were while we had the smart TV on, we were sifting through all the different shows. We had Charlie Kirk and his people on. Uh, on one end, we were watching also the Young Turks and looked at their commentary. MSNBC, Sam Cedar. We were even looking at some of our enemies. So, like, I'm I despise uh, Nick Fuentes and the Groypers, but uh, they're very theocratic. They despise us in every single way. I wanted to see what the far right was saying too, what InfoWars was saying as well. So I looked at like Nick Fuentes' stream on Rumble. I looked at um, Alex Jones' InfoWars stuff. Uh, I looked at Fox News. I looked at ABC and the mainstream media when it comes to their their coverage. And we all just 
united as friends at that party over over just seeing America, all of our allies and all of our enemies talk, give their own analysis and come to a good conclusion as to how the country was going to be that night, who was going to win and how we're going to move forward as a nation. And yeah. that was kind of cool. And um, and and I was happy that I did that uh, four years ago. I remember being very, very mad as a Republican, um, seeing that uh, my girlfriend at the time didn't want Fox News on and wanted to put on MSNBC or CNN instead, which annoyed a few of my college Republican friends. And then four years before that, I was watching MSNBC's Steve Kornacki coverage because I was I voted for Hillary in 2016. Um, and uh, I was super shocked that Donald Trump won the election then. Um, now I, I think of myself as kind of beyond all that. Um, yeah. There are issues that the country will face pertaining to all this, but I know we'll be okay. And s running an organization where you stick to those principles and where you have enemies on both extremes, it allows you to, to be more consistent and allow you to critically think and not get sucked into the fray as easily. Yeah. I I did the same thing with uh, watching the election results. I was on tons of different uh, corporate media and uh, independent media channels, just checking out what everyone was saying. I I had to laugh when I went to the live stream for Fox, though, because it was it was a live stream of Trump's people at Mar-a-Lago watching CNN. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to laugh about that a bit. Yeah. Uh, and I think the whole country can celebrate right now because we're not going to get those political text messages anymore. Oh my God. The spam that I've received. Oh, uh, it's, 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 yeah. You can't, you can't opt out of it. Like you hit stop, you text back stop and you end up with like 20 different numbers the next day texting you. Uh, and I don't even know if it's the parties actually doing it or just scams. I don't even, yeah, I don't even get involved with it, but I'm happy to see those things end. Um, when it, when it comes to what you're about with atheists for Liberty, it seems like the enemy is religion or ideology creeping into politics too much. Would that be mainly the theocracy? Effort? And yeah. if theocracy is supported by ideology or other theocratic elements, we are going to oppose it with consistency uh, and with truth. What, a, what, a, how would you define theocracy? Um, any entity uh, that wants to bring uh, religion into the political process by having the United States, either via the federal government, state government, or local entities, base its policies off of religion and not reason. You know, we I want to protect freedom of religion for a reason. So you can also do whatever you want in a tax-exempt religious institution away from our public schools, away from our government, where that is supposed to be void of stories and magic and mysticism and based upon statistics, based upon what we know in the material world um, and, and based upon the rightful idea of the United States being built not as some Christian country, not as some Muslim country, not as some Jewish country, not as some Hindu country, but as a secular nation. Uh, mm. The first in a very, very, very long time, you could argue the first ever. Is is the tax exempt status of religions problematic in any ways for you? Because to some atheist, yes. Uh, to me, no, it doesn't, because it allows us to then be consistent and say, okay, you guys, you re you religious groups, you get your tax exempt status, but you can't then be theocratic and try to bring your stuff in here. Mm. Um, in a kind of way, it's in a weird way, it's kind of a protection. But I know plenty of of atheists who are against that tax exempt status, and I understand why they're against that tax exempt status. And there have been plenty of cases in the past where there have been violations of that tax exempt status by certain religious entities. Um, but I think it's actually, in a weird way, a good argument for us. If that's kept, hmm. we get it. We get a, a lot of ammunition that we can use during debates, during these discussions, during policy discussions as well, against these agitators and against these theocrats, which is important. When it comes to uh, your what you believe as an atheist, how? How do you distinguish between uh, rationality and having atheism as sort of an ideology? 
Like, how do you keep it from becoming ideological? So atheism itself is devoid of ideology. Atheism is devoid of principles, really. It's devoid of, any, of all those things because atheism is simply not believing that a God exists. Um, we call ourselves atheists for liberty for a strategic purpose um, uh, in order to normalize the idea of secularism and non-religiosity and being an atheist and being a good person more. Uh, I, I have these, these stats in my head that have been here for like nine years. Um, a mentor of mine has said, he said this back in like 2015, such a long time ago now, um, that 90% of the US population knows what an atheist is, but only 50% of the population knows what agnostic is. You have like 15% that knows what a free thinker is, 10% that knows what like a secular humanist is, all these garble terms um, that really have nothing in there. Um, but it's so important, even though we have a list of principles, we have a list of stuff that you could say uh, more fit in the realm of the skepticism uh, label or the secularism label or the free thinker label or the agnostic label or whatever um, that we use terminology and we communicate to Americans uh, in a way that they can understand. That's why we called ourselves Atheists for Liberty. That hasn't stopped atheist groups from becoming dogmatic. That mm -hmm. hasn't stopped groups of atheists from causing problems that delay our progress. Uh, a lot of these woke atheist groups that'll defend religion as long as they're progressivism, which had nothing to do with half of what the, half of these groups were founded upon in the first place, succeeds. So their own religion has actually trumped their secular activism. And I have tried to gatekeep as much as possible to make sure that that never seeps into atheists for liberty. Because I've seen the left go crazy. I've seen the right go crazy. I've seen the atheist movement that I was a part of all the way back when I was in high school and in my early college years go crazy. And so... I like to at least think, as a benevolent dictator of AFL, really present <laughs> with a board, um, that I, I think I've seen a lot um, to, to not really have that happen. Uh, what was in the State Farm commercial? We know we're a thing or two because we've seen a thing or two. Uh, that, <laughs> that is, uh, that's us at AFL. We, we've seen extremism corrode some wonderful organizations and projects and entities that were built upon free thinking built upon an advocacy for reason. Um, we want to yeah. keep that going, but not do what those guys did over there. Not do what those guys did over there. Be consistent and listen to our membership and not ever fall for any Trojan horses. Yeah. When it comes to like being an atheist, I, I used to consider myself an atheist. Now I'm, I don't know, agnostic. I don't, I don't really care to label it, whatever I am. Um, open to religion, I suppose, but, uh, I'm generally against ideology and I'm also against religion becoming uh, too much of a part of politics. So I'm, I'm with you in a lot of senses. I can see how an atheist, an atheist is non-belief in a deity. I, I understand that. But as you're, as you have a politically engaged movement or nonprofit, it seems like there's, going to be more of a tendency to become ideological because you're 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 outside of yourself at that point yes. right that we that we have to take there there are certain political things that we can or, or you could say ideological things that we can include in our organization while knowing that there's a limit so there are plenty of things that we take from like the liberty movement uh, and other other kind of right-leaning counterculture movements that we've adopted into afl opposing wokeism uh having the word liberty in our name, understanding a cognitive liberty is a good thing. There are things that we've taken that is uh, traditionally seen as more left-wing too. Separation between church and state is a good thing. It shouldn't be some left-wing buzzword, just like how like personally, uh, outside of AFL, I'm an advocate, I love gun rights. Um, but like when you think second amendment or anybody say, saying, saying the words second amendment or don't tread on me in a conversation, what do you think of when you close your eyes? Oh, you think of some libertarian or right-wing activist when in reality it should just be something american it should be something that any knowledgeable american whether you're a democrat or a republican should advocate for yeah. and and so we in a way it's kind of nice that we've now taken stuff from both sides and molded it into our organization to show that consistency and hopefully for members of your audience but also for all the people that have seen us throughout the years that shows how honest uh, we are. That shows how how much we really do try on a micro level to never ever fall too too much to dogma. 
Um, and in many ways, it, we, we could have been a much larger organization even earlier. We could have gotten a lot more things done earlier if we caved to Christian nationalism or caved to cultural Christianity on the right and went on a ton of different podcasts. We'd be super big right now. Or if we caved to atheists for social justice and went all after Christianity, but, but no, not Islam, not, not any defense of any uh, minority religions like, uh, like Native American spirituality or Native Australian spirituality because we don't want to come off as imperialistic or bigoted. No, we're going to go after all of it. And we're going to have a diverse range of members because of that. And in a great way, it's allowed us in our uh, really over five year history at this point to not fall prey um, to uh, to that kind of dogma. That's always going to be a risk. Um, and we are humans. We are animals, but we are more reasonable than other animals. So I, I try to think that we are at least filled with the most reasonable, most uh, cognitively knowledgeable team, uh, team of people. In, in my organization to try their best, at least, to not fall prey like a lot of other orgs, a lot of other liberty orgs and a lot of other atheist orgs have. Yeah. When it comes to being a nonprofit, what are the rules for you? Like, what can you not do and what can you do? I've, I was thinking about this recently. Yeah. First of all, we have like NGOs that seem way too involved in our politics. I know NGOs aren't uh, nonprofits necessarily. They're a little bit different. Um but when it comes to nonprofits, I'll see nonprofits that seem very engaged with our politics and very partisan, which makes me wonder, like, what what is the purpose of a nonprofit if if they get to just operate like any other entity? Yeah, some of them really lean on that border. Um, but uh, there are ways to also, if you really want to make your movement a little bit more political, you could do that legally, but then you have to do extra paperwork to add on extra mm -hmm. echelons to it. So Atheists for Liberty, for instance, we're a 501c3 nonprofit. We are technically allowed to say lobby for certain things, but we can't allocate, we, we, the, we can't allocate the majority of our resources and our time to do that. But say if there's certain issues or certain legislation, we can do that during with a very, very tiny percentage of our resources. Um, what's better is for 501c3 organizations to band together and to create coalitions or to work with outside entities that might be a little more biased to accomplish that while the other organization remains its integrity, hence, you know, working with other people in various different groups. Um, the atheist movement in the old days did that in the 2000s. Uh, all these 501c3 nonprofits came together and formed the Secular Coalition for America, which technically still exists today on paper. Um, and uh, they created a 501c4 element that could lobby, that could mm. talk to Democrats and Republicans um, on certain pieces of secular legislation. You'll have other nonprofits that really get involved in the partisanship of elections, or at least on the border of it. Uh, let's cite Turning Point USA as one of them on the right in the conservative movement. Uh, they... Um, they started out as a like free speech on campus 501c3 thing in 2012 by Charlie Kirk. It was always ideologically right leaning, but then around, I would say 2019 and somebody correct me, could correct me if uh, I'm wrong. You started to see turning point action pop up, which is an outside entity that is technically in the turning mm. point family that has different tax statuses where you can do those more political things. And then you had students for Trump pop up as well. That was that was on the right in 2019, 2020 as well, which was overtly partisan, overtly political, but it didn't violate five, uh, Turning Point USA's uh, status. Um, despite the fact that I think there was an IRS investigation or some kind of audit into Turning Point, I forget, um, but they still exist and they exist for a reason because you're able to technically legally kind of do those things. I'm trying my best to keep Atheists for Liberty out of that. I think it is very important that patriotic atheists do talk to Republicans, do talk to Democrats, do engage in politics, mainly as individuals, and maybe one day for the sake of our nonpartisan 501c3 values, us maybe developing an arm, maybe like the secular coalition did. Not maybe not like what Turning Point Action and 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 Turning Point uh, and Students for Trump did in that aspect, but but at least trying to make atheism not partisan. So one of the great things that we did when we launched is we actually tabled at the Conservative Political Action Conference. Even though we weren't a Republican organization, we weren't directly a conservative organization, we filled in a white space that the woke atheist groups, which claim to be neutral and wanted to normalize atheism in all politics, wouldn't do. They'd prefer to go to Netroots Nation or some progressive or conservative conference. So I always like to find gaps to fill them in, but I always try to make sure that we don't fall prey too much 
to the whims of the progressive movement or the conservative movement or the liberty movement or whatever. We are an atheist organization that is separate from all of that, but we will have allies. We will have connections with people in these various communities to help us accomplish our projects and our goals and to grow the mission and the movement. Awesome. Um, when it comes to rights, uh, I, or when they come from God. Oh, sorry, what? <laughs> I'm kidding. I said they come from God. Nothing. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, that's what I want to ask you about. That's like largely the conservatives, the people who are religious, they'll say rights come from God. When yeah. I'm talking politics, I try not to, uh, I don't have a problem with religion, but I, I don't make religious arguments in general, unless it's like a, a rational argument for something that touches on religion. I, I just don't go mm -hmm. into religion because it just... I want to, you know, if, if you get into like a God argument, it's like, all right, well, there's nowhere to go with it. Like you just, you just can't really go anywhere with an intellectual conversation. Somebody can have the right to believe in something, but if right. that's their invocation for an argument, it, it then, then it doesn't, goes. it doesn't mean anything. I, I'll, I'll give you an example, Artie. Yeah. Let's pretend that I... I'm religious, and I believe in the god of the invisible flying dragon that's above me right now in studio. Let's pretend that this god exists. I just created this god, but I genuinely believe that this god exists, and I wholeheartedly have the freedom of religion to believe in it. And we get into a policy discussion about abortion. Thomas, why are you pro-choice? Or Thomas, why are you pro-life? Well, thank you, Artie. I'm pro-choice or I'm pro-life because that invisible dragon in the sky right now that I just created told me to protect the sanctity of life, or to protect a woman's life uh, right to choose. What a load of crap. But somehow we give this kind of level of politically correct protection to Islam, to Judaism, to Christianity. Um, somehow when it comes to that, oh, why, why, why should we base our entire nation's viewpoint and apparatus and resource management uh, to either protecting or outlawing the practice of abortion, for instance. Oh, because because God said so, because Jesus said so, because uh, the prophet Muhammad would have approved. Um, give me a break. Give me a break. If you are, a, say you're a Christian and you saw policies being made based upon the Islamic religion because it makes Muslims feel happy in Minnesota and Michigan, you'd laugh it off. And we need to apply the same thing consistently with, with you know, with everything. Well, let's, you know, I'll answer kind of your second concern about rights. Mm -hmm. Um if rights came from a monotheistic God that originated in uh, that where tales originated in the Mediterranean region, uh, despite the fact that similar stories originated in that region a thousand years before that those same modern monotheistic religions took, um, how is it comes that every other uh, religion, every single other religion in the world with different viewpoints, they don't have a basis for mora morality at all, but somehow for your own faith and everything, that is when our ability to have morals, our ability to feel emotion for people, our ability to, uh, to sympath uh, sympathize with people, all of a sudden that came into effect. I think at the end of the day, that is simply a political talking point. Oh, rights come from God. Rights come from God. If rights come from God, uh, then why is it that every other totalitarian country exists where those rights aren't there? Um, it's because we pulled from the Romans, from the Greeks, from certain civilizations past as, as an intellectual group of founding fathers that were very educated, very sophisticated, this stuff to create what we now know as modern American rights that have later on, um, you know, uh, transcended into Europe and other parts of the world in the modern world, the UN, whatever you want to call it. Humans created those rights. And then also if you're an atheist, right? If, or if you're somebody who doesn't even believe that a God exists, you might not want to use the atheist label. Maybe you're agnostic. Maybe you're questioning things or whatever, right? You believe in rights, but you know that God doesn't exist. That just solves the question right there. But because it's, it's overtly political, because religion, even in 2024, even with this election just being held yesterday and with the dynamics being very different than, say, 2004, 1984, 1994, religion it's still very politically incorrect to criticize religion so we get into that debate because there are portions of our society that don't want to have the uncomfortable conversation of knowing that we mortals humans people with those ideas in our country created those ideas it was us and we should pat ourselves on the back for that even if we might not look so good um when saying it in front of certain people 
if rights come from just people, which I can understand the argument, what's the argument for preventing people from dissolving those rights? Well, it becomes then a civilizational conflict on the most part. It's why the United States, it's why our European allies in many cases have fought societies that have thought that rights should be different than how we see them. It's why World War II happened. It's why the war on terror happened. Uh, and I'm not getting into a foreign policy discussion on if certain wars are good or not. I'm just saying it as like an overtly philosophical kind of talking point. Um, uh, you know, there, there are different ways how, of how societies see those rights, but we fought to the bitter end to make sure that our view of rights, our view of how society should be governed, succeeds. And that our society and our civilization doesn't dissolve by those who wanted to conquer us and destroy us. Um, it really is kill or be killed in that kind of fashion. It, why atheists need to fight. Yeah, it just, it seems... The religious people, the pre, the people who invoke religion or God for rights, it seems like they have, I mean, just like I was saying before, it's kind of like you can't argue against it. It seems like they have a good premise for why they can make their rights inalienable, why they can, why can they, why they can lift their rights up to something mm -hmm. that humans don't have the right to alter. And I, I think they would look at other countries as like North Korea, for instance. It's like the rights actually exist. They're just not being respected by the, by the humans in charge there. Mm -hmm. So what I wonder is with atheists, how, how the reasoning stands up. Like how do you reason rights maybe to the level of inalienable? Or are this they is where not? I'll cite to various different atheists who, who, who are more philosophical than I am. I, I just consider myself to be a community leader and representative who have made a lot of good arguments when it comes to this. So, uh, and there are various different philosophical viewpoints on this as well. So, you, you know, we met in the Liberty Movement. We met at Freedom Fest. The yeah. objectivists are super duper big there. Uh, I'm friends with a bunch of open objectivists and closed objectivists that have tried to create lots and lots of powerful works that discuss this. One of them is my friend and fellow atheist for Liberty advisor, Craig Biddle, who's written numerous different books on uh, these topics. In fact, actually, if anybody goes to Atheist for Liberty on YouTube uh, or on our other uh, social media platforms, you can find m my show that I host, which is coming back soon, Tuesdays at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. I interviewed Craig and we got into a bit of those discussions. And we also talked about some of the various books that he's published too, um, which go into those details. Okay, well, maybe you might not be an objectivist because the liberty space, for instance, is so freaking huge. We have existentialist uh, William Irwin, who gets into some of these discussions as well, who's written a bunch of books and has talked and given a lot of lectures on that from King's College in Pennsylvania. He's on our advisor board as well. What if you are more of a classical liberal and you are not a right-leaning guy? You never really liked Rand. You're not an uh, existentialist even. You like Sam Harris, so you like Daniel Dennett. Well, they've written plenty of books too about the topic themselves. Or go watch an Alex O'Connor Cosmic Skeptic video where he'll break it down in a series of like 10 different videos that he's given over the course of his YouTube career going into detail about this. We've answered the questions. We have a lot of the experts. We have the experts. We have a lot of people that have already gone into detail about that, but some people don't want to concede to it because of politics because of just the conditioning that they've received when they were younger to have the comfort of believing this stuff and to then say, oh, well, my God thinks I should be pro-choice. My God thinks I should be pro-life. So therefore, let's enact that. And let me say that on stage at a political debate in front of thousands, if not millions of people watching me. I would love to hear uh, your views on abortion, actually, because it, it'd be interesting to hear how a rational argument for that is because obviously religious people, they have their argument because of religion and he, the pro choice. I'm, I'm pro choice myself, but I, mm -hmm. I don't buy into the dogma of being pro choice of like, you know, people will say it's just a clump of cells or whatever. And it's like, that's a political argument to me. Like right. saying it's a clump of cells. It's a, it's a talking point that's existed outside the steps of the Supreme Court in protest for like 40 years. Yeah. Like, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, sorry, I interrupted you with that question. No. I'm assuming you want me to answer it. Yeah. Um, 
I, I so want to do a cop out here. Um, the only, but I'll answer it. I'll answer it in two parts. I so want to do a cop out. And the reason why is because um, one thing I try to have atheists sort of do is stay out, out of the abor abortion debate in general because we have so many great members who are non-woke, love liberty, love reality, who are um, pro-choice and pro-life. So I'll give both arguments. I'll try my best to give both arguments. So the, the uh, pro-life atheist argument would be, well, the, the um, elimination of that fetus is murder. We, in a secular society, are able to judge murder as the extinguishing of a specific life. You don't have to believe in a supernatural creator to see that. For example, you could have an atheist judge sentence a man to prison for knowingly understanding that someone killed somebody in the street in cold blood. You don't need a, a spiritual or, or, or fairy tale esque reason to come to a conclusion that a certain form of murder is wrong. And I have seen a lot of pro my pro life atheist colleagues, um, really be very passionate in trying to show Americans, hey, the pro-life movement isn't, should not be exclusive to um, this kind of religious nonsense we're talking about. And quite frankly, let's pretend you're religious and you're pro-life as well. Why would you want to communicate to so many Americans that are becoming statistically more secular by saying, oh my God thinks I'm pro-life, so therefore I have to do that. You should argue, anybody, atheist, Christian, Buddhist, Jew, Muslim, uh, Sikh, whatever the heck, you should argue your talking points to the American public from a secular, non-religious point of view. Otherwise, you're not going to win the argument. And it's only going to become more and more that way later on. So anyways, that's the pro-life view. Um, and uh, there, I think there is an organization called Secular Pro-Life that exists out there. They have a Twitter page. Mm -hmm. I haven't made much contact with them, actually, but they do actually legitimately exist. Um, uh, the secular pro-choice argument that would be made is very similar to the just regular pro-choice argument because you don't really see too many religious arguments being made for the pro-choice position, but you do have like certain woke or left-leaning churches, the ones that like hang the BLM flag and LGBTQIA stuff outside their stuff that, that would make the argument that, that God loves women and women and God loves the idea of you having rights and, and being an equal in society. And because of that includes your bodily autonomy. Um, I have a personal position on abortion. If you really want me to give the posi my personal position outside of AFL on it, I will. Um, but those are those are the two perspectives. And I'm, by the way, I'm admitting that I'm grifting on this. I'm admitting that I'm copping out because on a topic like abortion, it is so contentious in America. You will have a conservative movement that will one day become 100 percent pro-choice. I, I mean, 100 percent atheist atheist, not even secular before it ever becomes a totally pro, like fully pro-choice movement. Um, although Melania Trump came out recently as, as pro-choice, um, uh, probably to get suburban women to vote uh, for Trump. Um, uh, I mostly stay out of it. I mostly stay out of that debate. But I do, I do have a personal view on that matter, but it doesn't reflect, um, it doesn't reflect Atheists for Liberty. But on the abortion topic, let's debate abortion off of reasonable arguments, not religious ones. Well, yeah, and that's kind of where I'm getting is I... So I'm, like I said, I'm generally pro-choice, but at the same time, I'm not like pro-choice of like any abortion at any time is completely okay with me. Yeah. I think. And, and to be fair, I think that's most people that are yeah. pro-choice. That's most people who are pro-choice. Uh, and just like I think uh, I, I've met a lot of pro-lifers. I think I think a lot of people who are pro-life, they do. They are as well in favor of most of them. I've met are in favor of exceptions when it comes to life of the mother um uh uh you know and 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 some people you know even go in to say rape and incest and stuff like that so i i, I would say the majority of americans are kind of like not on the extremes of that but the no. pro-choice and pro-lifers are kind of in that kind of middle ground uh more yeah i think it's a, a difference of trimester i guess you could say yeah i think a small percentage of people are at either extreme where they they want no abortion whatsoever available and then people who want it just completely free but at the at the same time, it's it's kind of one of these things that I've tried to understand with myself. And the only way I can really understand it is by admitting that my views on it are actually arbitrary. Because where I believe, I mean, it's it's kind of like, eh, yeah, third third trimester, not, not feeling as good about that. And uh, early, you know, I feel like people should have a choice, especially early on, because it'd be pretty crazy to restrict people from 
mm-hmm. making a decision that they haven't really they haven't really gotten that far into. But yeah, there's just it, it feels arbitrary in, even in my own analysis of it how mm-hmm. I believe uh things should be. Uh and I don't have like a I'm not promoting any policy or anything. I just it's kind of interesting cuz I feel like a lot of people are stuck there too where it's like when you really get down to it it's it's all just arbitrary. It's all yeah. just kind of what you personally feel like would be a reasonable on abortion, I'd agree with you. Yeah. And everybody, everybody is totally subjective when it comes to abortion. The yeah. pro, every pro-lifer I meet has 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 differences in tiny specifics of what they like and what they don't like. Um, same with a lot of pro-choice people. Um, and with religion, it makes it even more messy. <laughs> my God says you should be pro-life. My God said you should be pro-choice. Okay, great. My 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 invisible dragon that I just made up in the office on this podcast says something else. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, with religion, it's hard to argue against someone. Again, once they invoke God, it's it's a really difficult conversation. Not that people are, it, not that there's anything wrong with them having a God, but with these conversations, it gets very difficult to explore once you yeah. get to that point. Yeah, it's uh, w- when it comes to Muslims, you you said you've been critical of uh, Islam. We have. How how has that been? Because like you said before, you're kind of making enemies with the woke left on that or whatever. I I hate the word woke, but oh, it's overused. Yeah, <laughs> it's like socialist. Yeah. Uh, it's like it's like uh, racist. Yeah, it's like you know. Um, uh, <laughs> um, uh, I I try to. I'm trying to go back to using like the 2013 term of like so i i say woke because a lot of people in the modern 2024 context see it as woke yeah. but I, I i it used to be like social justice yeah. uh, and then before that it used to be uh political political correctness um i'm trying to use the terms a little more interchangeably um to show that i'm not just like some guy calling like obamacare woke or like yeah certain tax policies woke you know, like, come, give me a break. Now, that's just a liberal view versus a conservative view on those issues. Um, woke should be defined as something extreme, like out of the ordinary uh, when it comes to that. But um, what were we getting into? What were we getting into? Uh, is- Islam. Islam. Yeah. Um, yeah. So some of this predates atheist celebrities' existence. I used to be in a lot of other atheist NGOs and nonprofits, and I used to have positions with nearly all the major, major ones. And... I was known in the atheist community at that time as that 17 to 20, 21 year old uh, in my late high school and early college years making these very long ranty Facebook posts that the entire atheist community was very glued to. Um, and I, there would be, there would be sometimes comment threads as long as a hundred to 900 comments in them from the atheist world in the U S um, debating over these social justice issues. And the first thing that I started to do in my, in, in coming out of the closet in my disdain of social justice culture, especially from the atheist point of view, it is criticizing the Islamic religion to equal footing as criticizing the Christian religion. This, this caused a massive uproar in culture war history actually around a decade ago, either in October or November of 2014. You had uh, Ben Affleck going on real time with Bill Maher with Sam Harris and simply criticize Sam with Sam Harris and Bill Maher criticizing Islam at the same rate of them criticizing Christianity as the new atheists that they were. And Ben Affleck was livid. And when I woke up the following morning after seeing on TV that that showing live, all these so-called free thinkers, all these so-called skeptics, all these so-called new atheists being super pissed off about it. So I would make these threads calling out Islam just like I was calling out the Christian right. And I would lose lots and lots of friends from lots of different localities of atheist meetup groups throughout the U.S. and state coalitions and and other stuff, and I would I would lose a lot of friends and lose a lot lose some connections there because I was honest. I was the new atheist that the, these a lot of these atheist groups and orcs were supposed to be. They were supposed to be criti- critical of Islam just like they were critical of Christianity. They were supposed to be accepting of Republicans just like they were supposed to be accepting of Democrats. I was that consistent, nonpartisan, um, new passionate new atheist guy. And so I made sure that when we created Atheists for Liberty, we were consistent in opposing all forms of theocracy when our separation of church and state is violated or when there are talking points or, you know, YouTube clips to respond to or things to talk about on podcasts to be consistent in our criticism of Islam. I've even uh, drawn, uh, uh, wrote, uh, did a drawing of the Prophet Muhammad in one of our YouTube videos uh, a few months ago. 
and I am proud of it. I want to be able to say and draw and do what I want to do as a proud American, as an advocate of liberty, and I don't care who I offend. I don't care if I offend the woke feminist with purple hair from Penn State University. I don't care if I offend the far-right Christian Nick Fuentes Groyper supporter who wants uh, Catholicism or Orthodox Christianity inflicted upon all of us. I don't care if I annoy the Islamist that tells me I can't draw a certain thing in my own country, in my own community, in my own place. That's ridiculous and unacceptable, and I will fight you any day, at any day, at any time, with ideas, by the way, from YouTube, blah, 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 <laughs> um, to protect those rights as a proud atheist, as a proud free thinker, and as a proud American. And yeah, makes me happy that we are consistent in that way. And so we've been calling out Islam, um, proudly so, with the same amount of, uh, uh, with that same amount of vigor. I generally don't have much against Muslims. Like I don't have a problem with Islam at all, but I mean, I, do. I don't hate Muslims just like I don't hate Christians, by the way. Like, yeah, I, yeah, I have an issue but... with, I have an issue with wokeism. I have an issue with Islam. I have an issue with Christianity, but I also have a Christian family. I also have Muslim and ex-Muslim friends. I also have Jewish friends. Mm -hmm. I also have friends that are a bit more to the left who might disagree with me on certain critical issues um, and friends on the right who might disagree with me on certain critical issues. So it's about, it's about the ideas and it's about the forces of people trying to, to, to force those ideas onto the American public that I have an issue yeah. with, not the overall population of just normal religious people. That's yeah. Cool. Well, yeah. And the, the idea that you can't draw Muhammad is forcing an idea on you because it's restricting your behavior. It's actually kind of funny when you think about it, because it's like if you were drawing a picture and you told me it was a picture of my mother or something like that, and I got mad at you for it. Let's say it was like a horrible picture. Yeah. It doesn't really represent my mother to me at all. And then you just say it's my mother and I'm like, I'm really mad at you because you drew a picture of my mother and it's, you know, I, I don't like it. Yeah. I'm giving you power over me by kind of accepting that as a picture of my mother and it seems the same kind of concept because if somebody's getting mad at you for drawing muhammad and you're an atheist you do you, yeah. you probably have no idea what muhammad should look like in their eyes anyway it's kind of interesting for people to get mad at that and consider that blasphemous when it's like right in their view, you should be coming from a place of ignorance, so it shouldn't even matter, right? If you're an Islamist and you want to stop the Danish cartoonists of 2006 or the Charlie Hebdo's of 2015 or South Park or Atheist for Liberty or Atheist Groups by doing that, from, 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 from pissing you off, don't make yourself easy to be pissed off at something like that. Yeah. Don't make yourself so ignorant and so warped in your beliefs to where you cannot handle the fact that people are going to disagree with you. Um, and then it gets even worse with some of these people threatening to kill other citizens simply for having that difference or simply for drawing something. That is ridiculous. That is unacceptable. And it's not like so 2001, 2002 to have an issue with that too. It's yeah. still a problem, guys. The foreign policy issues and the cultural issues and the political alignments have just changed. But that, that issue of Islamic theocracy and of Islamism is a massive freaking problem. Hence why I'm also co-chair of the membership co uh, committee and also on the social media committee and a founding member of the Clarity Coalition. It's yeah. a group of activists, politicians, educators, and more people that have Islamic backgrounds and also don't have Islamic backgrounds. We have a lot of actually uh, Muslims and ex-Muslims that are part of the org. I'm actually the minority of one of the few people that never had an Islamic background that are part of it that wants to stop the spread of Islamism around the world and in the West. And um, we are always hard at work um, because even though like a lot of the war on terror conversations died down, a lot of people, when it comes to the topic of Islam, like that was very controversial to be politically incorrect about Islam in 2014, 15. That's kind of been like, okay, like been there, done that. Some people feel that way. Yeah. Guys, it's not over. Islam has been around for thousands of years and there are people in this world and in this country who want to kill you for simply drawing a stick figure, and then you calling it Muhammad is a joke. That's insane. That's a problem. That's something we need to be vigilant about. Vigilant about God. Still tied from the election night party, but it's an issue. And um, more and more atheists need to wake up and realize, okay, cool. Your election is over. Your candidate won or your candidate lost. 
We have civilizational issues that are going to transcend 100 years. Who cares in four years or eight years where you have the same politicians that will say this election is the most important election in our lifetime? How about saving a civilization that could die by the early 22nd century and everything that we have fought for over the last 300 to 400 years be meant for nothing? Yeah. Nothing at all if we don't get our act together. That's more important than political gridlock. When you have people that are trying to kill you over drawing a stick figure, that's a problem. We need to fight and we need to fight now. It's one of the things I, I do feel people, when we when we're so focused on America sometimes that we forget that everyone outside of America, great people all over the world, of course, but yes. there are certain uh, political regimes and often there's religion tied to them that do hate our country just for existing yep. granted we have some stuff in our history that we shouldn't be proud of obviously of course but i'm curious with islam and politics do you feel like it's a it's a just an aspect of islam that creates it there's a lot of regimes that are have religion islam mm -hmm embedded into the politics is that just an aspect of islam is or is it possible to separate those two it is technically possible to celebrate the two uh, to, to to separate the two um but it is it's more tied in to the religion um uh, I, I, at least in this context there is there is a very similar amount of violence in the bible um and, and just disgusting things that are in the old and new testaments as there are in the Quran. It's true. Um, you know, somehow you have some Christians that are like very anti-Islamism that will somehow think that their book is holy or their book is better. However, I'll give Christianity credit. I don't like to simp to Christianity in any way, but I'll give Christianity credit in this one regard. It did go through, uh, at least in, in the geography of Europe, where it was most prevalent, it went through a reformation. There are Christian groups in Africa who will still kill you, just like Muslim groups in Africa that will kill you. Uh, uh, there, there, there are actual militant sects of Christianity too, but overall, if we're talking about physical militancy and threats of death in the modern world, it is mostly coming currently in 2024 from the Islamic world. Hmm. There are certain Islamic countries that are more moderate and better than others. That's why you have every single liberty tech entrepreneur that we've probably met at Freedom Fest having an apartment in Dubai. Um, <laughs> uh, but there are also a lot of things in Dubai that you can't do. You talk too loudly. You argue the wrong way. You you I can't drink alcohol as far as I know. Uh, there are certain re restrictions, I think, still for women in many respects. Um, uh, same with Saudi Arabia, our so-called ally, our so-called – they are just as barbaric as Iran. But they happen to suit our political interests more. The king of Saudi Arabia suits our political interests more. For all, So all of a sudden, they're the good guys and the Iranians are the bad guys. You have Iran, which is, you know – a big, big issue. One of the problems that, uh, speaking of Trump and him coming into office, if this would have been the Harris administration, if Harris won, the incoming presidential administration will have to deal with Iran and its continued efforts to want to have a nuclear weapon. Why? Why do we have to have that foreign policy discussion? Because in their religion that has not been reformed, they want to destroy the decadent. They want to destroy the satanic. They want to destroy these evil Western cultures, the, the death to America, right? These, these evil, decadent Western cultures that are promoting degeneracy. It's not what Allah would want. And, you know, according to a lot of Saudi and other hijackers, on a sunny day on September 11, 2001, they wanted to take as many Americans uh, with them, including nearly my father on that day. He was supposed mm -hmm. to go to work on the 88th floor of the North Tower. I live in New York State. Um, I am of that generation where there are some people in school when I was in school that didn't have parents because they died on September 11th. Um, it is still very much a problem. It's still very much an issue. It doesn't matter what dopamine high you get, um, you know, with whatever cultural issue there is. Oh, Islam. We criticized Islam 10 years ago. It's over. It's not over, guys. There are people who want to kill you for drawing a cartoon. There are areas where it's been reformed more than others but there's significant portions of uh, the Muslim population around the world who want to enact legislation to stop you from doing things that are critical of their religion. There are certain people around the world that would want to kill you.
for having that difference of opinion in 2024. And while we're talking and hang out in podcast world, while maybe you're having a, you know, playing some video games on the side, those issues that are not just talking points, that's actually happening. And yes, Christianity has reformed more than Islam. Yes, there are certain aspects of Islam that are reformed. Still a problem. Still a massive problem. Still a big workload that we have Atheists for Liberty have to work on and other, other human rights organizations and nonprofits have to work on. Hmm. All the more reason why I'm still passionate, even though I'm tired from election night. <laughs> All the more reason why I'm still going on here because we have a lot of work to do and we have to communicate that as much as possible. And we need more volunteers and members to do that. But yeah, it's one of the reasons why we still need to speak up about Islam, no matter what culture war we're in. What is your approach to that? Do you, is it a matter of de-radicalizing people that have gone more radical, or is it mm -hmm. discrediting the religion entirely? On the Atheist for Liberty aspect, it is more discrediting, discrediting the religion. One mistake that a lot of entrepreneurs that create nonprofits is they want to do everything. And um, there are a lot of great organizations that like to really go into those places in the world and do that de-radicalizing. One of our advisory board members, Faisal Saeed Al-Mutar, he's also very known in the liberty spaces and the liberty movement. Years ago, he formed a nonprofit that has it's exploded. It's exploded. It's called Ideas Beyond Borders. Mm -hmm. And they take modern enlightenment texts, atheist texts, secular texts, um, other Muslim texts, everything, and translate them and try to spread more enlightenment Western literacy to these places that are disaffected. Um, there are organizations such as Free Hearts, Free Minds, run by another atheist liberty advisor and Clarity Coalition founder, Yasmin Muhammad, who I work with very closely, which tries to help, especially young women and girls in the, in the Islamic world. With us, we need to be the bad guys here and we need to tell the truth with vigor. We need to tell people that Islam is a lie and a scam, just like religion. We need to tell people that Islam is not compatible with the West. We need to be those people to do that. And then what will happen? Some people, and this is a, this is a great strategy that happened in the atheist movement years ago. Some people will like us. Some people won't like us. And then some people will be like, well, I really want to help. I appreciate Thomas's vigor. But I, li I like this approach or this soft approach. I, I don't agree, but... Go then support some of the entities that are then doing a lot of great hard work in other areas. Everybody has their positions and their comfort zones. Um, but that's where Atheists for Liberty stands on that debate. We're great when it comes to podcasting. We're great when it comes to our shows. We're going to be doing stuff on college campuses more soon. By the way, that's why you should all uh, become members of Atheists for Liberty and also follow us on social media. Um, uh, you know, Because we're going to be doing a lot. Communication on our end is key. And then building up a United States-based atheist movement, a new, new atheist movement, because the old one died out, um, to really put the pressure on these theocrats, to put the pressure on uh, those that are trying to implement these bad ideas and to ruin all of our movements. I go I'm, on tangents, too. I say no, that on every good. show, but I really do. <laughs> and I listen to myself after I go on that rant. I'm like, man, I'm talking. It's like, you probably have more questions to ask. And we're already like... An hour and 20 minutes in. <laughs> no, I mean, it's all good. It's all, it's all about gaining your perspective. So I'm curious about this a bit because with Islam specifically, you're dealing with the culture, not that all Muslims aren't aware of liberty and, and Western values and stuff like that, but you're, you're dealing with a culture that largely it's foreign to them. Like Western values are not something that's part of their culture. Oh yeah. How do, how do you approach that conversation? I try to approach it more domestically. So uh, I'll do, I'll play cop out again, but we'll get into a little bit of foreign policy chat that maybe some of your viewers will like. Um, the pull out of Afghanistan in 2021 or was it 2022? I think it was 2021 by the Biden administration. 21. Yeah. Um, the failed pullout of Afghanistan. As the United States and coalition forces were leaving, uh, we made a silly decision to abandon an air force base and try to instead uh, uh, try to move bases to a civilian airport. We thought that our great Afghan military secular allies um, or not really more, more moderate Muslim allies could hold off the Taliban. And, you know, uh, keep things going. The moment we left Islam and Islamism and jihadism 
overtook the entire country. Everybody welcomed it. The Afghan military laid down their arms. Half of them fled like cowards, or some of them probably just joined the Taliban because they were so unorganized. Um, you literally had civilians that were literally trying to latch onto U.S. cargo planes as they were leaving, some of them dropping out of the sky because they couldn't hang on. That's how crazy that whole process was. No. Afghans wanted Islam within Afghanistan. Now, to be fair, there are a lot of ex-Muslims. There are a lot of atheists. There are a lot of free thinkers. There are a lot of people that are that have been stuck in Afghanistan. Uh, and, and there are people that, that know of the values of the West and know the values of the secular society and love it. That's why I think a lot of those nonprofits are still very helpful going into those places of the world to do that. Um, uh, but if you say you're a libertarian and you're listening to this, you'd be like, yeah, like, duh, this is why we shouldn't be getting involved in all these foreign conflicts. Yeah, yeah, you, you have a point. You could absolutely have a point. But let's get into this conversation then. Let's talk about immigration from an atheist and secular perspective. We have a lot of people that are coming in, not just from our southern border, by the way, or, or not just through our southern border, but plenty through our southern border and other parts of, 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 uh, of, of transportation. A lot of people that are coming here, not just from rather the uh, uh, South America and Latin America, but people that are coming from the Islamic world. Mm -hmm. We are having a repeat of the, um, what's it called? The Syrian refugee crisis that Europe faced in 2015 and 2016. We're having that here. You're having the populations of Minnesota and Michigan grow with people who want to implement Islam as your local, state, and federal policies in a secular country. Um, add on as well the fact that atheists and Christians, uh, for a matter of fact, are not having children as much. So what's going to happen? Within the decades that follow, you are going to see theocratic, authoritarian, anti-liberty, anti-libertarian people that will repopulate and not only then be hanging out in the states of Minnesota and Michigan, but transcend to all, go, transport themselves to all 50 states and eventually get into your local government to trample on your liberties. And so it's not just some issue of, oh, well... Let's just have some libertarian foreign policy, blah, blah, blah debate. Okay, cool. Like we're not involved in foreign affairs. Those foreign affairs are domestic affairs now. That U.S. theocracy debate, it's happening now. Islamism is rapidly growing in, as a force in the United States. It's not like some London knife gang kind of conversation, not some whole Canadian problem. They're having it worse than we are, but we're going to be the U.K. in 10 years. We're going to be Canada in five years because hmm. of political correctness, because of liberty people not getting their act together and realizing we need to have conversations about religion too, and without people having the chat about Islam. This is why I really don't care about elections this, as much. This is why actually, uh, well, they matter when electing the right people, you know, to oppose this kind of stuff. But but like the partisanship of, of everything. This is why I like building a movement instead. Because we need soldiers. We need all hands on deck to defend the greatest country that the world has ever known by people who will want to put you in jail or some that will even want to kill you for drawing that stick figure of the Prophet Muhammad. Why is it that I have my ideas, but why is it that the left tends to not be willing to criticize Islam? Because is most it... Muslims are brown. Done. That is the quickest answer okay. I can easily give. They are brown. Most of them are brown skinned. And because they're brown skinned, we have this view of, oh, we don't want to be like the segregationists of 50 to 60 years ago. We don't want to be racist. We don't want to be bigoted. We don't want to be intolerant. We don't want to be the bad guys in the movie Mississippi Burning. And because, oh, we really don't want to have that look. And by the way, I am against racism and bigotry and all those things. But because we so desperately want to be anything that doesn't even re remotely resemble bigotry in any way. Um, we get super apologetic and in the name of progressivism and righteousness and defending minority groups that are not in the majority, like a good progressive or like a good social justice activist, we will defend people and even their bad ideas from criticism in order for us to have this feeling of self-righteousness and to think that we helped the little guy. The problem is, is that some of those little guys who believe in those things think of you as a degenerate <laughs> that should be extinguished in a country that they think is built on Satanism or Freemasonry or whatever, decadency, any of that stuff. 
this is where the progressives fail. This is where the progressives fail. They are actually protecting the most socially conservative ideas that are currently in place in governments of the world right now. But they're defending it all oh, because I don't want to look like the bad guy. Be yeah. the good guy and oppose the bad guys. They're right in front of you. Here's something. I don't care that, if they're white or brown. Yeah. I don't care if if you know they're blue or pink. You know, people with bigoted and bad ideas are people with bigoted and bad ideas that we need to oppose. No. I'd love to talk about something that will piss everybody off. Uh, Israel Palestine. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's something that you really can't talk about without pissing off some people or some everybody. In, in a lot of cases, but it's yeah, it's an interesting situation because you have people on a little bit more on the left that are pro Palestine, even though uh, Hamas and Palestine would uh, not support basically anything that's promoted on the left, and then you have the right that's more favorable to Israel, but also has a blind side to the to the level of influence that Israel has on our politics. Yeah. Um, how do you approach that as an atheist, an atheist for liberty? So we'll go first into atheist for liberty and then Thomas Sheedy as an atheist. Yeah. Uh, atheist for liberty actually rarely touches the Israel-Palestine debate. We are opposed to Hamas. We are opposed to the Islamic, theocratic, jihadist, Islamist forces that want to kill Jews, that want to kill secularists, that want to overtake civilizations that they see as degenerate people people narrow this debate too much as a foreign policy debate and not as a civilizational debate that involves secularism um but there are a lot of very similar to abortion there are a lot of secular human rights based arguments that have been made on both sides pertaining to the actions of hamas versus the actions of the israeli government that quite frankly as president of atheist for liberty trying to get an organization of people with different views it's a waste of time for atheists for liberty to get involved in every aspect of that debate. Yeah. As a 501c3. I, Thomas Sheedy, have my own views on it. Um, but when it comes to, like, there are certain things atheists for liberty has made statements on against certain attacks and things like that. But on the most part, I really let our individual members debate it out in their own chats or in our Discord or whatever about however they individually want to talk about it. So we have most of our members, I would assume, are pro Israel. Um, because it is a country that shares our values more compared to the Palestinian territories. Yeah. Uh, and pay, yeah, obviously, like no duh. Anybody can see that. Um, so I would say most of our membership, including myself, I'm very pro. I am pro Israel. Um, that is my that is my personal stance outside of my presidency of AFL. Um, however, there are also very good, awesome, rational atheists that have criticized and some even of a Jewish background that have criticized is Israeli foreign policy. And I and, and if people want to have that debate in a healthy, open, respectful context, that's fine. Jake Klein is a great example of this. He's very big in the liberty movement as well. He has a blog called Black Sheep. He's our Virginia State Director currently for Atheists for Liberty too, and a good friend of mine. He has debated people at, at, at popular free speech conferences like Dissident Dialogues, which happened in, in Brooklyn several months ago back in May, about that conflict. And I am able to be mature enough to know that Jake... As somebody who's an atheist, somebody who cares about human rights, and even has that like former Jewish background, he's coming for, at it from a place that is not bigoted, decadent, disrespectful to other Jews, disrespectful to people that have seen the crimes of Hamas and the Islamists and the jihadists. And I've seen people get into very passionate debates and discussions with him. Yasma Muhammad and Jake had a very friendly but heated conversation at um, our DC reception back in May before we all gave speeches and just celebrated AFL growing um, and doing what we were doing. Those conversations can happen, but I, depending on the nuance and the specifics of the debate, I make sure to separate AFL from the individuals that are having them. Yeah. Um, so hopefully that gives some kind of nuance to this because again, I'm trying to build a movement here. Yeah. We obviously have our view of Islam, of Orthodox Judaism, of theocratic Christianity, of all that stuff, but we position ourselves in certain ways where other organizations can position themselves in other ways too. Atheist celebrity doesn't have to do the heavy lifting on everything. Yeah, interesting. Um, when it 
when it comes to ideology specifically, like I, I don't see a big difference between ideology and religion. They operate in basically the same way. But with ideology, it, it seems to morph faster. Uh, the rhetoric, the words used morphs a little bit faster. That's part of the reason why uh, you've given three words for like political correctness, uh, social justice warriors, and wokeness for yeah. the ideological phenomenon on the left. How do you deal with the wordplay that is inherent in that? Like the wordplay that comes with that. How do you deal with yeah. that? Because from a religious perspective or not from a religious perspective, but when you're talking to religion, you're, you're generally, you know, the words that are associated with that religion. You talk, yeah. you're like, people know what God is. They know what church is. They know what these concepts are. These words haven't changed. But then when you talk about ideology, when you're talking about ideological viewpoints on the left that are, they're morphing the words and it's almost strategic in some ways. Yeah. How it's, you, it's 100% strategic. How do you how do you handle that? Experience. Mainly just experience in the group that you're talking to. So, I've interacted with classical liberal left-leaning people, I've interacted with progressives that disagree with me, I've interacted with libertarians, I've interacted with conservatives. Yeah. Um, and I've interacted with some of my enemies on the far far right. There are groypers that have confronted me too. And so when it comes to talking to certain specific groups, I am able to come to a reasonable conclusion because I like to consume all forms of media. I like to see what my allies are talking about and my enemies are talking about. And so that whole election day uh, discussion where I was like, I was watching Sam Cedar on one end and like Nick Fuentes, <laughs> someone who despises this organization. I like to think that I'm always becoming more fluent in the talking points of my friends and my enemies and the mainstream right, mainstream left, far right, far left, everything. So let's talk about like Christian nationalism as a term. I don't like using the word Christian nationalism when talking to conservatives. Why? Because they hear it on CNN all the time talking about just like, if you like Donald Trump and wear a MAGA hat, you're a Christian, white, cis, Christian nationalist, even though Christian nationalism is real. It's, it's in the form of like the Groypers. It's in the form of like the Roman Catholic Gen Z activists that want to say Christ is king and like bring back the Latin mass and outlaw the 19th Amendment of the Constitution. Those people are actually Christian nationalists. Um, the problem is, is very similar to the word woke. Christian nationalists has been so <laughs> diluted sometimes. So when it comes to you, we met at a libertarian conference and a lot of libertarians, they, they, they disagree with some of their conservative co-allies partners on some of these terminologies. So I think it's appropriate for me to say Christian nationalist and you as a libertarian podcaster will understand what I'm saying when I say Christian nationalist. Yeah. When I'm talking to left-wingers, I usually don't like to say woke because they'll think of their, you know, 70 year old uncle saying those God darn libtards, you know, them pushing their socialism on everything and their woke policies. I get emails still from the local Republican committee where they were talking about, we're going to stop the woke. We're going to stop the woke agenda, uh, you know, on election day. I'm like, Oh God, it is so cartoonish and it's become so partisan that they'll describe anything that's left, even like liberal, like Obama liberal, yeah. Uh, 2010 liberal as woke. No, woke it was meant to be social justice extremism. It was meant to be Trigglypuff screaming at, at a conservative for being on campus saying, keep your hate speech off this campus, or, or some woke person screaming at an atheist for criticizing Islam like they've criticized Christianity. That social justice warrior culture, that is wokeness. But the problem is, is then, you know, certain groups will only understand certain things. And the moment you say one word without adding that kind of nuanced conversation, like I'm defining to you and your audience right now, which, by the way, then takes time. Imagine if I'm at a convention and talking to somebody and they're heated and they're mad. And then I have to do this kind of explanation, kind of like I'm doing to you, which we can do here. It takes up time, creates confusion, creates problems. So thankfully, because I've been able to see what terminologies does the left use, what terminologies do the right use, what terminologies do Christians, Muslims, and theocrats and Christian allies that are maybe libertarian or like whatever, what, what, you know, what do all these groups use? How can I properly communicate yeah. while also simultaneously using words that that 90% of America also understands? I really try to use experience mixed with statistics to kind of to kind of ground that. And having that 501c3 org where we have the Democrats and we have the Republicans in our org, 
it allows me to have to, to also learn from my membership too and our volunteers and our directors. Um, it's through experience and getting your ass kicked mm. and, and making some enemies in the process or making some allies in the process too, unfortunately. There's no perfect way, but it's, it's understanding the nuance and who you're talking to, who, you, who your audience is. Yeah. Uh, just to be clear, I don't even uh, define myself as libertarian or the podcast. I, yeah, I, I, by the way, I want to apologize. I barely, I barely, I don't know you too much, yeah, but I yeah. know we met at Freedom Fest and I've been to a, a bunch of other podcasts from people I've met at like Freedom Fest and Liberty Con and those spaces. So I, I don't know what you are no. ideologically or politically. So forgive me. Well, I mean, that's the thing is I don't care if somebody can call me libertarian. They can call me conservative. They can call me liberal. None of it matters. Uh, I'm not the same. Yeah. And it's like, it's I actually, <laughs> I'm the same way with being called white. You can call me white, but I don't have to accept <laughs> that definition. <laughs> so I say I'm allegedly white. If uh, Oh, that's funny. About it, Cause <laughs> it's a social construct we're talking about that people buy into. So <laughs> mm. uh, yeah, I, I, I don't really care what people call me. It's, I, I don't, it, a lot of people, I mean, I feel like people should, accept that more like you don't have to accept the uh labels that other people give you and it doesn't have to be something that you have to be concerned about if they're labeling you incorrectly it, it really doesn't right. matter um, I, i'm i'm literally this so like i'm literally the same way yeah. not to not to you know poke you know make more enemies here but like i i would say i would i'm like a 2014 liberal 2019 conservative and 2024 center right independent minded thinking yeah. person I, I don't know i don't know because with the culture wars right they always change yeah. and so you're always on a different line within the u.s political spectrum and culture war spectrum you know uh i wouldn't even say we're in peter bogosian wrote a great article called culture war 2.0 i don't even believe we're in culture war 2.0 anymore i think we're in like culture war 2.5 or culture war 3.0 at this point yeah. like like combine like everybody teaming up and putting all their differences to just fight woke that died out in like 2022 2023 yeah. um so i don't know what we're in now um but um but yeah the, the labels always change that's why again i like the irs restriction i like that i actually don't have the rope to hang myself in that way i can work within certain bounds to make friends everywhere to care about principles rather than party yeah and it's made my life a lot healthier as a result of that so yeah anybody can call me whatever Want to call me a evil right winger, an evil, you know, liberal in disguise, a, a libtard, a, a libertarian, or what, you know, whatever the heck. I don't care. I'm Thomas Sheedy, who believes in the same main principles he's always believed in when he got into politics. Sometimes they aligned with the Democrats. Sometimes they've aligned with the Republicans. Sometimes they've aligned with the Libertarians. Sometimes they've not aligned with any three of those groups. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I I care about my values and I'll fight for them. And if anybody wants to join me with that. I'll tolerate you. Yeah. The way I am politically, and I've always been this way, like I don't really, even if I vote for Republicans or Democrats in any given election uh, more than another party or libertarians, whatever it might be, uh, it's usually pragmatic. I mean, it's always pragmatic with how I'm dealing with it. But it's, I'm actually more concerned about the long-term trends than I am about like any one election because like the left has gone too far in recent years, but I'm equally as nervous about the right going too far. If they get too much power and then you can end up in a dystopian nightmare from the right, like you can end right. up in dystopia from both sides. And I don't think it's, we get in this, uh, you know, black and white thinking of where it's like, oh, I just need my team to win. If my team wins, it's yep. good. And that's like, if your team wins, that that means you should be even more vigilant in a certain sense because you need to make sure your own your team own... doesn't go crazy. Yeah, and you're um, not going to see it as easy. Yeah, I I like one thing about the hyperpartisan. I like radicalism to a certain degree when it comes to tactics sometimes you do have to fight sometimes you actually do have to be aggressive and sometimes being too moderate on something and being like i'm just a haven for all ideas and all ideas are respectable or we're just going to be like some educational think tank thinking about ideas but not fighting not getting in the trenches mm -hmm. sometimes that that leads people with enlightenment values people like you and i to fail in many respects and that's where i can actually respect the radical right and the radical left 
for, for that. And also like plenty of passionate, like libertarians and objectivists too, for understanding this need for radicalism and to be passionate. But as long as you don't have that corrupt your ideas, tactics are different than ideas. Mm. As long as you do not grift on your principles, that's what really matters at the end of the day. Because tactics will always change. Yeah. Battle lines will always be different. Who you align with, like I've said five other times now, will always be different. Yeah. And sometimes sometimes being passionate and being radical and fighting to win, that's not always bad. Uh, but some people, they confuse that for being then too hyper-partisan or too bad or, or negative or whatever. And sometimes yeah. it's actually a good thing. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really interesting viewpoint. Uh, to touch on the woke thing, you know, that people define it so weird and differently. I saw a post on X months ago, but basically saying, <laughs> if you have small dogs, you're woke. As a guy with small dogs, I had to laugh at that because I'm like, oh, my God, come on. Are we going to get this ridiculous with it? Woke people despise me, and um, I've grown up with small dogs. Although I grew up first with a big dog. So so if anybody who really judges on that, I'm, I'm like a red blood. I was raised as a child being a real, real non-woker yeah uh no but i i grew up most of my life with, with small dogs uh yeah. woke despise me so yeah. I, I i that's that's crap <laughs> you're not and, and and if you were woke you wouldn't have me on the podcast or you'd be challenging me a lot more because i've been on woke podcasts and you can just see in their face the disgust they have in talking to me right. um or sometimes the mistake they have in booking me and then realizing i don't agree with them on their woke stuff um i don't see that in you and we both have small dogs so <laughs> Well, and, Crap. you know, I, I'm sure I'll, I'll interview people and get into more heated debates. I have had heated debates and it's fine, but it's also, I mean, Jubilee, I don't know if you've watched them at all, but they, they came out with a bunch of election videos. They had, uh, Ben Shapiro argues against, uh, 25 woke students or something. Yeah, they had Shapiro, Kirk uh, on, on the right. Shapiro, Charlie Kirk, yeah. those were the two big ones for the right. And, and the then you had Destiny yeah. arguing against like 25 Trump supporters, I think. Yeah. Those were like the three big ones recently. Yeah, Actually, Destiny's was, I would love to interview Destiny, but his was actually annoying because he was just yelling matches. Uh, ben Shapiro is a bit more sophisticated in debates than him. But still, it's just arguing. And it's like, I... I've always disliked that where it's like, you're just cutting each other off. No one's actually listening. And it's like, there's no point in this conversation anymore. Whoever agrees yeah. with this person is just going to keep agreeing with that person. Whoever agrees with the other person, there's no, nothing actually being worked out in those cases. So I, I find those situations more frustrating. Like if I disagree with you and I do disagree with you on some things, it doesn't matter. I it, I'm not going to be harmed by letting you finish your thoughts. Like, I'm not going to be, oh, no, if I don't cut him off right here, if, if people actually listen to him finish his thought, then I lose. Like, I just think that's kind of a ridiculous yeah. way to approach debate or conversation. But it seems to be the dominant way that our politics is discussed. It helps people's careers. It helps people monetize their channels more. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm fine with some of it. Again, I'm fine with being loud. I'm fine with certain radical tactics. I'm fine, like, like. If you have to do certain things and make a certain amount of videos, but videos that you believe in yeah. to where you're, you start out by saying certain things. All right, Thomas, we failed here. Let's change this up in the AFL comms department. Let's have you start with an opener of something controversial that you believe in. And then you grow, blah, blah, blah. And then like maybe there are certain videos where I have to tone it down. I have to be more diplomatic. As long as I'm not grifting, I'm not changing my views just to say something loud and stupid. Like I've seen a lot of people in politics and culture war stuff have just to gain a buck, just to get monetized, just to just to partner with a certain progressive or conservative think tank uh, on something. Um, I've, I've seen some I, I won't call any of them out. I've seen some some even anti woke atheists mm. be quiet about their atheism because they want to work with certain NGOs, certain think tanks, certain companies. And that I actually do have a problem with. I, I like like. This idea of, well, I have to make money here. I really, I, I have to lie about who I truly am. That sucks. Yeah. That really, really sucks. Especially if they're, if you're trying to work with somebody who's trying to like, their, their whole messaging is like freedom of speech and ooh, being really good on that and all that. Like, obviously there's Overton windows of certain organizations. There are certain people that would not even be good fits for Atheist for Liberty. Every single company and uh, nonprofit and all that, they have brands and Overton windows, but like, 
within at least their Overton window, you would think that would be acceptable. But I've seen that grip too much where people want to make money, people want to be loud, and so they have to say something stupid where they, that they don't even believe in just to get the views. It is the number one topic in all of politics that I talk about. Like if anybody literally goes to Atheists for Liberties shows that uh, where I happen to be the host, it will be me mostly complaining about how certain atheists are pretending to be Christians. Or it'll be me complaining about how certain atheists are pretending to be woke. Or it'll be me complaining about certain people lying about who they truly are. I, I, I despise that. It makes us not improve. It makes us not get healthy. If you were in the liberty movement and you watch Artie's show, right, I'm assuming most of your audience is, is very heterodox, you know, that's not that's not the kind of community that we want. That's not the kind of country that we want. That's not the kind of dialogue that we want. People should be able to say whatever they want to say, be respectful in some cases, yeah, be professional if you have to be professional, whatever, but don't lie about what you believe just because it's cool or just because you're going to you're going to get some nice check partnering your channel with some company. Screw that. Yeah. You mentioned NGOs, and I'm curious that your thoughts on this, because you're probably a little bit closer to the situation than I am. It okay. seems to me like NGOs are a huge problem. The way that they're functioning as these, they're non-governmental organizations, but that line doesn't seem to be very clear. Mm -hmm. Like, for instance, with our with our border, my understanding is there's NGOs that are going to South American countries and actually gathering people up at different times. It hasn't been as prominent the last few years, but they would gather people up and, and encourage them and, and support them in their journey to the southern border to getting into yep. the United States. The whole and, trucking situation and, and issues of, of rape and sexual yeah. assault and disease. Yeah. Um, and the, yeah. Their link to government, they're supposed to be separate, but the link seems pretty close in a lot of instances. Uh, you might have, like when Trump was in office, for instance, from 2016 to 2020, the NGOs were very active across the southern border. In, yes. and, and maybe they were under Biden, and I just didn't hear about it as much. But you, I'm hearing about all this at the time, and it's like, okay, if these people... NGOs are linked to maybe Democrats or anything like that. That seems pretty problematic that they're that this link isn't, you know, banned or or something like it. Just that's the issue with lobbying. Yeah. That's an issue with lobbyists, right? That's the issue with with all this stuff, and that's the issue with certain politicians being comfy with certain heads of other organizations to where yeah. there are initiatives that could easily be cut. Talk about, talk about like if you're, if you're right leaning or libertarian or conservative and you'd like to cut you waste, waste, wasteful spending, stupid programs. There's a lot of them disguised as humanitarian efforts. Mm. Yeah. It's, it's, it's so disgusting. Um, there are good ones though. Yeah. I like, I, I'm not a Bernie Sanders guy. We're like, the lobbyists are bad. Blah, blah. Lobbying is actually really cool. Lobbying is good. It depends on what you're lobbying for. Yeah. It depends on what group is doing the lobbying. It depends on what group is benefiting. Some of it is good, but there's a lot of ones that are not. And, um, oh, should I, should I be a little partisan? Okay. One thing I think is cool about uh, Trump winning the presidency, Elon Musk getting more involved in the Trump administration, he said that one of the things he wanted to do is cut a lot of wasteful spending. If, if I'm Elon Musk, I want to like find half of these like NGO related companies that are you know, organizations that are getting uh, this kind of government funding to do stupid things like that, especially with the border, by the way. Like I know Elon's talked about the border recently on Rogan. Mm -hmm. I would I would cut that immediately um, uh, in the Clarity Coalition. We I believe we have a section on our website that talks about certain uh, press releases. We in the Clarity Coalition have been closely monitoring certain Islamic NGOs that get government funding to do theocratic type things. Uh, and it's really disgusting and really problematic. I hope those get cut too. Mm -hmm. And by the way, again, guys, fact check me on that. Check out the Clarity Coalition website. I believe it's up on there. If anybody has any questions on which ones I'm talking about, I can get them for you. Uh, Thomas.Sheedy at AtheistForLiberty.org. Send me an email um, or message me on X. I'm at Sheedy Tom, S-H-E-E-D-Y-T-H-O-M. I, I put my label there. You can follow me on X and also on other social medias, social media platforms. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm fully in agreement with you. Uh, hmm. but I, but I do think there are some good ones, but they, all of them should be investigated and there should be a conclusion on which ones are doing what they say they're doing and which ones are not.
Well, it seems like one of those situations that you can have nine doing good things and then one organization blurring those lines and doing the wrong thing. And it, it makes the whole thing look bad. It, it makes yep. the whole thing look corrupt. So, yep. That's, that's the issue with me uh, yeah. running a, running an atheist nonprofit. It's always making sure that we, that, that some famous atheist doesn't say something stupid that like detracts us from doing certain things. That's why like, I'm not a fan of the cultural Christianity stuff. And I'm not a fan of like atheist defending wokeism either. It's like, no, don't make statements defending bad ideas because then we got to do like damage control and put in like double twice the amount of work because one bad mm-hmm. apple did something and annoyed it or one other atheist organization did something really stupid that made us all look bad. Um, <laughs> no. uh, it's something I have to contend with every single day, guys. When it comes to, I know you're long-term focused, you're focused on the movement, but elections do have short-term repercussions that could end up being long-term. They do. How, how does the election last night with House, Senate, everything going Republican, how does that uh, affect your, your short-term plans and, and what would have been different had it been maybe the opposite? Yeah, so I'll, I'll have some of my partisanship leak out here, but I'm going to try to be as, as non-biased as possible. There was one really nice thing that I liked that the Trump administration, the first Trump administration did. Um, there was an executive order. I, I was I was friends at the time with some people in uh, local Republican politics who were at this uh, um, Arthur Laffer. He's a he's a right wing economist. Um, Arthur Laffer gave a lecture at SUNY Binghamton, um, I believe, in 2019. Um, and there was a massive protest, uh, uh, issues of uh, threats, I believe, and other stuff. There was a lot of footage of this at the time, and Laffer and others had to be evacuated. This caused then-President Trump, at one of his longest speeches ever at CPAC 2019, uh, I believe this was CPAC 2019, not CPAC 2020, or this was at Turning Point Student Action Summit 2019, I forget, it's one of those conferences, Mm -hmm. where he decided to sign an executive order protecting freedom of speech on our college campuses. That is a strike against woke institutions that are promoting stuff that actually are antithetical to our secular enlightenment activism, if you think about it at the end of the day. At the same time, then candidate Donald Trump during this election cycle said, I believe on the Lex Friedman uh, podcast or some other similar interview podcast that like, he really hates the fact that religion has been in decline and everybody should be religious again. And that's a real shame, real shame. When there are a lot of people that have been saying, actually, it's a cool thing that Donald Trump has been the nominee for the Republican Party, because Don- this idea that Donald Trump is some evangelical person or like a Mormon like Mitt Romney or like kind of like how the GOP used to be in the old days is a sign of progress that both the Democrats and the Republicans are becoming more secular. I still hold on to that talking point. I could be I pretend I'm a Democrat. I could still say that as a good talking point. Um, but I don't I don't like that either. So President Trump just won re-election. There will be some good things that I think he will do. There will be some bad things that I think he will do. The same would have been the case if Vice President Kamala Harris won and she ended up getting to power. It's Mm -hmm. kind of weird with Kamala. Um, So with her, there's footage of her, I believe, from 2017 or 2018 saying that woke is fantastic and we need to really, really implement that more. Um, But simultaneously, you will probably, because the Democrats have become more secular than the Republicans, unfortunately, I wish it was both even uh, at this moment in time. Uh, The Democrats, when it comes to that old secular coalition, uh, as woke as it's gotten, they've also really secularized the left more and the Democratic Party infrastructure. So let's pretend that there's certain secular initiatives that we need to be enact uh, to have enacted as a secular movement or an atheist movement on the national level. It might be good to then have an in with the Kamala Harris White House in order to get that done. Regardless of who uh, is in the Oval Office, there's always going to be more bits of work to be done on one front or one war war front, and then maybe smaller bits of work on another. Um, and that's just the reality of the culture war. That's the reality of politics. Uh, I uh, pay attention to politics very closely. I see the positives and negatives in everything. Uh, and that is how Atheists for Liberty is going to be operating at least for the next four years when it comes to this. Awesome. Well, Thomas, it's uh, been really great talking to you. I'm, I'm happy we finally got the chance to do this. Uh, I love to ask people about books when they come on. So uh, what are some books to you that have been influential, that that mean a lot to you, that maybe you'd like uh, listeners to know about? They could be revolve around atheism or anything. So um, The God Delusion is one of them. 
Um, I believe, is this the one that is signed by Richard? Let's see. I believe it is. Do, 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 do. Uh, my, yep, I got it. My signed copy of The God Delusion by Richard Dawkins himself. He is the most athe famous atheist yeah. in the 21st century in the world. You could argue the most famous atheist in the history of the world. Um, uh, that is the book that has swept millions upon millions of readers to really question the validity of religion and the belief in the supernatural in this century. Um, it is probably the most famous atheist book to date. If anybody from you know the more political aspect of things is trying to learn about the atheist world, reading The God Delusion is one of them. I don't care what people politically think of Sam Harris. He has still made a lot of impact. There are things I agree with him on, don't agree with him on. Sam Harris is one of those four most famous atheists. The End of Faith was that book that brought Sam Harris to national pro uh, 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 prominence, and I think people should read that as well. Um, really, I'm going to just suck up to the Four Horsemen real quick, but then we can get into some others. This is my favorite out of all of them, God is Not Great, by the late, great Christopher Hitchens, uh, someone who I really, really look up to in his works. Um, uh, it, it talks about how religion poisons everything, uh, how religion is a massive problem. And I'm more of a history nerd than a science nerd. So coming up, uh, when Hitchens really got into the politics and the history of things, I was able to resonate actually more with God is not great compared to the God delusion. And then, um, the recently late philosopher who unfortunately died in April, Daniel Dennett, he was one of those four horsemen. He died, uh, due to some medical health complications back, uh, back in April. Uh, he wrote breaking the spell. So those four atheist books that shaped the West and created the modern day new atheist movement that, that rose to prominence and then died due to the social justice stuff. I highly suggest people read those books. But then I try to shape myself when it comes to political tactics and when it comes to the variety of different atheists we have at AFL, because we have a lot of different atheists who hold on to different philosophies. Recently, I've been trying to learn more about objectivism and get into Ayn Rand, because we have a lot of objectivist members. Maybe even some of your audience considers themselves to be objectivists. So um, The Virtue of Selfishness was the one, first book that was recommended to me by um, a, an ex-girlfriend of mine, actually, Billy Rivat, who also was very heavily um, prevalent in the liberty movement. Um, uh, what was it? Uh, and then I have some people that are helping to host some, some meetings here uh, and, and grow our infrastructure. I've been recommended to read uh, Discovery of Freedom. Uh, Rules for Radicals is another great book. It's by actually a leftist, but it goes into actually how radical tactics are, are sometimes a good thing. Um, and, then, and then just some uh, various different books on capitalism, on freedoms of speech. Um, and I'm trying to become as well more learned in science. So here is Richard Dawkins's new book, not an atheist book, just on biology and animals. The Genetic Book of the Dead, or Darwinian Revere. Um, I was just part of his uh, national tour, and now he's on tour in Europe. It's a global tour, but I was part of his North American tour, hmm. and a lot of our Atheists for Liberty members were as well. Um, and I was the opener in Portland, Oregon for him. Um, and the illustrations in this book are just wonderful. So uh, a lot of people that get into atheism and skepticism, by the way, read up on skepticism, everybody, um, you'll automatically develop this love for science and the, the natural world around us as well. Um, but, but mainly those four starter Four Horsemen books uh, are, are, are definitely the, the early recommendations um, that'll get you at least to, you know, proper new atheist learned status about how religion is bad, bad. Uh, uh, I do want to ask you one more thing. Have you have you ever come across an argument, a religious argument that you haven't completely figured out how to tackle yet, how to address? There is a few, um, but the, the, the answer that I usually have for some of them. Uh, and some people say, ah, we, we beat Thomas, we beat the atheist. But when he says this, sometimes my answer really is, I don't know. No. But you don't know either, no. right? There's a reason why there are so many different religious wars and conflicts happening because we have not solved that question. If we solved that question, there'd be only one religion in the world. And there would probably be like world har harmony and peace in the most part because we all be uh, believing in that religion. Probably it's none at all because... God isn't real, um, <laughs> but um, uh, but you, you know what I mean. It's it's it's. I don't have the answer to every question right now in the known universe and cosmos, and neither do you. Mm -hmm. An ancient book by Mediterraneans in the desert from two thousand years ago that happened to be normalized to the Roman road system isn't really a good explanation, and you can't really blame me for not having any you know scientific explanation for certain things yet. Um, uh, you know. It is the religious that are making the positive argument that there is a God, that their God is real, that their supernatural stuff is real. And it's not up to me, the atheist, or up to you, Artie, the skeptic or agnostic, 
to have to say, well, oh, I got, I have to come up with a large paper trail as to why they're wrong. They're the one that are stating something without evidence. They have to, you know, they have to be the ones to really provide the proof. Yeah. But we can be the skeptics. We can be the activists in calling them out for stating this stuff without any actual proof, without any actual evidence. And I always try to improve myself day by day as an activist, as a skeptic, as a free thinker. Um, I always try to shape my leadership style to be better and to try to do what I can to communicate better with people. So um, there are definitely even better atheist debaters than me. But uh, but I, I always think that I can improve on that. And uh, anybody who wants to uh, watch good atheist debates, I'll also recommend Cosmic Skeptic. Uh, Cosmic Skeptics, his recent debates with Ben Shapiro, he did another one with Michael Knowles. He's pretty good on that. But like, watch any of the new atheist debates as well hmm. from the 2000s and 2010s. Uh, oh, my God. The Bill Nye. I don't know what people think of Bill Nye now due to, due to woke stuff. But but watch uh, people that want to watch the Bill Nye Ken Ham debate from 2014. That's why I was really starting to get into the movement. Oh, my God. That's when Bill Nye said, uh, uh, what was it? Um, I think he was asked, what would make you change your mind and become a creationist? And he said, evidence. Any amount of evidence, I would happily do it. When Ken Ham was asked, oh, what would make you change your mind about creationism or make you lose your position? Ken Ham, the creationist, the apologetic Christian, said, nothing will make me change my mind. You know, um, having that humility... And having that ability to be honest with the people you're communicating with and debating with is essential. And it'll only make you a better skeptic and a better activist and a better educator in the years ahead. There's power in admitting you don't know. Definitely. Uh, I also well, have to read more. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I love the conversation. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, before we wrap up, you want to give uh, listeners... Uh, just tell them where they can find you, where they can find your organizations, email you, yeah. work with you, social media, all that. So guys, if you want to learn more about Atheists for Liberty and what we do, the membership benefits that we have, uh, go to atheistsforliberty.org. That's A-T-H-E-I-S-T-S-F-O-R-L-I-B-E-R-T-Y.org. We have membership for very cheap levels, guys. Become part of an ever-changing movement and talk to me. We need more state directors. We need more volunteers. Uh, we offer internships. We, we do quite a lot uh, here at Atheists for Liberty, even though we're not as big and as grifty as the other organizations. We, we are able to be honest when we can be. Well, we're, we're honest all the time, but like we, we, are, we are humble about it. Um, learn more about us on our website. You can follow us at Atheist Liberty on most social media platforms. And if you can't find us there, just search up like on Instagram. It's one of them. Just search up Atheists for Liberty. Um, follow us on social media. We have shows that are coming back every single week on YouTube, three YouTube shows and one show on X via spaces. Um, we want all of you to be there. And if you sign up as a member, you can actually become part of our spaces that are recorded with mm -hmm. famous atheists and famous people in the culture wars. You could be a part of that discussion and be a part of history. Um, and uh, you can follow me because I, I do more than just actually being the president of atheists, really, believe it or not. You can follow me on social media, Thomas Sheedy, at Sheedy Tom, S-H-E-E-D-Y-T-H-O-M. I would love to talk to all of you, and I hope you all enjoyed listening to the show. I love going on shows when I can to do my best to communicate, despite you know having a big party the night before seeing... Lots of things happen in our country right now. Um, but uh, it was a real pleasure. I always love to meet new podcasters at conferences, get their business contacts, follow up with them via email, and, and you know get people onto shows as well. So, um, so people are always welcome on our shows too. Um, we're growing a movement here, everybody, for liberty, for cognitive liberty. Um, and I appreciate all of you for wanting to join us hand in hand in making America a freer and better place. Awesome. Thomas, thank you so much. Thank you, Artie.